we start, just a small announcement. At 4.45, right outside Darbar Hall, we have a play called Finding Me by the Yoa Ekta Foundation. And now, uh, our final session for this year at the 9th Z Jaipur Literature Festival at Mahindra Humanities Center, Darbar Hall. Chasing Lost Time, finding pro translating proofs, I'm sorry. Jean Finlay with In Conversation with Chandrahas Chaudhary. Welcome to all of you. Uh, my friends, there's, it always seems to me that um, although the English language is very vast, there are a number of words that it lacks, and one of them is one word, a concept is, uh, it, there's nothing to describe, there's no one word for the kind, the kind of happiness that comes specifically from a life lived immersed in the great works of literature. And even if we lack a word for it, we perhaps have an image of a person who could be that, and from, uh, if you look in the last 100 years, certainly a, a candidate who incarnates this sort of spirit is Charles Scott Moncrief, uh, the translator, the English translator of French and Italian literature, very influential in the beginning of the 20th century. And we have with us today his um, great, great niece, Jean Findlay, who has written a biography of C.K. Scott Moncrief, um, in which, um, Unfortunately, also Moncrief has become, for many people, just the translator of Proust, the first translator of Proust into English. But we know from this book, when you read it, that uh, he had a magnificent life. He was part intellectual worker, part um, free spirit in the world. Um, he was a writer and a translator. He worked, he translated from more than one language. And uh, most mysteriously, and this is something that's only come to light recently because of Jean, he was also a spy at the same time as he was a translator. And actually, translation was a fantastic cover for him for his work in espionage at the time of the World War. So, Jean, welcome to Jaipur. And uh, please tell us a bit about uh, how Scott Moncrief first came to an awareness of... Uh, all of literature's possibilities at a very young age because his education and his family background had something to do with that, isn't it? Yes. Well, first of all, I'd like to, s to say that it is a great joy to be here at uh, this, which must be the peacock of all literary festivals. And I think actually joy is that word that you're looking for, to be immersed in literature, great literature all your life. And this was something that Scott Moncrief was lucky enough to have from a very early age. His mother was a writer. Um, in the 1870s in Scotland, this was very rare, and she was a literary writer. She wrote short stories for something called Blackwood's Magazine, which a lot of the great writers of the day wrote for. Um, she uh, wrote, um, she wrote for, sorry, she wrote for Blackwood's Magazine, which was um, a literary magazine which many of the great writers of the day wrote for, like George Eliot, Thomas de Quincey. Um, she um, also wrote articles for newspapers, and she actually earned enough money to support her sister, who was one of the first women at university in London. So Charles grew up under her tutelage. She educated him until the age of eight, and he learnt um, from her everything about great literature. So she used to read to him George Eliot and Robert Louis Stevenson and Jane Austen, as well as the great poets. In fact, when he was six years old, he learnt by heart the whole of Milton's Ode to Christ on Ode to Christ's Nativity on Christmas morning, which is huge. Um, if anybody knows, it's a very, very long poem, and for a six-year-old to memorise it is something quite extraordinary. And he was quite an extraordinary little boy, in terms of of loving literature. I was reading this, I was reading this book one night in Delhi, and I came across these lines. Mm. King Marsilis he lay in Saragoose, went he his way into an orchard cool. There on his throne he sat of marble blue, round him his men full twenty thousand stood. Called he forth then his counts, also his dukes, my lords, give ear to our impending doom, that Emperor Charles of France the Deuce into this land is come us to confuse. And I couldn't but, uh, and the, the French is given just above it, I couldn't but admire the genius. I couldn't but admire the genius, which uh, you must, uh, I wanted to like, talk a little bit about this because what I li like very much about your book is it's a fantastic mix of biographical detail, literary criticism, and quoting from all of, all of his translations. And 
today it's very un uncommon for a translator to translate both poetry and prose, isn't it? It's almost as if those two streams have become two different specialities. But Scott Moncrief seems to have possessed this giddy confidence that you could take any, little, any text and put it into English, in French or in, or in Italian, and from any kind of period as well. Yes, he did, but he, he, did, he uh, giddy is a good word, in mm. fact. Um, he did, he, he, this, this um, chanson de Roland, which you have yeah. just quoted, mm. he found after the First World War, and he had come through a terrible war himself. Um, he um, had been very badly wounded and could, and could hardly walk, and he'd lost many of his loved friends. And so his suffering was great. When he came upon this poem, uh, uh, for him it expressed his feelings about war. Um, Firstly, his, his, his initial reaction to war was one of uh, excitement. And this uh, is about the jongleur, who, uh, the chanson de Roland is the jongleur who sings the battle into action. He goes out in front of the army and sings the battle into action with this amazing poem. And while he was at the front, Scott Moncrief uh, used poetry in a different way. He used poetry... Uh, to protect himself from the horrors that were around him. So he always had with him his Oxford Book of English Verse, and he would read it to his uh, fellow soldiers, and he wrote poetry himself in order to protect himself from the horrors. Mm. How old was he when the First World War began? He was 26. Mm. And uh, the, uh, you write about this in the book, there is this tension in his mind between what he sees, which is the futility of all the suffering, mm. and the sense that nevertheless that war sometimes is necessary and you cannot turn away from it and that uh, bloodshed cannot only be seen as um, waste, it also at some times must be seen as sacrifice and older tradition of heroic poetry somehow leads us back to that time. Yes, because his, his initial reaction to war was different from later on when he became more cynical. But he did fight all the time for the fact he believed, and so many people did believe as they went into the First World War, that this was a necessary war, that Germany was going to invade Britain and that they were there to protect it, um, and that the death of his friends was not in vain, that they were dying for a good cause. Um, but then, of course, all the, all the poets who came out of that First World War and who started publishing their poetry in the middle of the war, Siegfried Sassoon um, and Robert Graves, um, everybody thinks about Wilfred Owen, but his poetry was not, in fact, published until after the war. But Secret Sassoon's poetry in particular uh, sounded this note of cynicism about that it was futile, these phenomenal numbers of dead people. And Scott Moncrief initially, because he was a critic, and he was working as a critic in the trenches, in the front line, he initially criticised Sassoon terribly, and so they ended up as enemies quite early on. I'm interested in the state of technology at the time. If you're fighting a war in the, in the year 1915 and you want to write what seems, from our perspective in time, you know, something quite trivial, you want to write a review of a book while you're in the trenches, where did you write it, how did you write it, and how did you send it? Well, he um, would dig a little muddy hole out from the side of the trench, and he would um, sit there with one of his bags and put his paper on it, and he often used the purple pencil that officers needed to use for censoring letters. So a lot of his uh, critiques were actually written in this particular pencil. Um, and um, he, somehow he always found time to write. One of the things about the war for Scott Moncrief was that... Uh when the war began, he was not a translator yet, and he wanted, he wrote verse, and he wanted, he thought of himself as a writer, or a writer in the making. And during the war, he falls in love with somebody who sort of expands him as a person, but reduces him as a writer. After that time, he begins to feel he's not going to be good enough, because the person he's in love with is so much better than him. That's Wilfred Owen. Yes, Wilfred Owen. So he met Owen, Owen um, after he was wounded. He met him at Robert Graves' wedding. Robert Graves was another great war poet and was a close friend of both, uh, well, of initially just Scott Moncrief. And um, uh, Robert Graves was getting married, um, although he had had a homosexual past, which he regretted. He was marrying uh, a woman. And um, uh, Wilfred Owen was at this wedding, and... Scott Moncrief um, spoke to him, and they got to know each other very well, um, and a lot of different uh, critics and academics um, uh, still battle over whether they actually had an affair or not. Um, uh, but they certainly had a friendship which influenced both of them equally. So uh, 
Wilfred Owen was at that time a completely unpublished poet, and he was experimenting with the use of assonance, which is the, the, the vowel sounds on the insides of words. Um, and Scott Moncrief was writing, was translating the Chanson de Roland, and in French, there are far more, uh, there are far more rhymes than there are in English poetry. And there was something to do with the blend of assonance and French poetry, and they would, they would read their poetry out to each other, and Owen encouraged Scott Moncrief in his translation, and likewise, but also, um, Scott Moncrief uh, influenced Owen in something quite crucial, which he was severely criticized for afterwards, in that his opinion that this was a war worth fighting uh, uh, was one of the things that um, made Owen decide that he needed to go back. And of course, he died before the end of the war. Mm. So we see uh, that, uh, in this wonderful chapter, you have about a third of the way in the book, uh, Scott Moncrief uh, wants, himself wants to go back to the war so that he can be uh, in the same country as Wilfred, but they find themselves in, uh, in um, different countries, partly because Scott Moncrief himself sort of um, is behind Owens wanting to return to the war, isn't it? So in a way, uh, their lives together have taken them separate ways. Yes, they've taken them to separate places on the Western Front. Mm. Um, in fact, Owen was, well, Scott Moncrief only got back in not to fight because he was too badly wounded to fight, but he got in because he was working in uh, intelligence at that time. He came back after he was wounded and, and got in to, to work in, in um, the, uh, the intelligence and propaganda section. And so he was allowed to go back to cover the war um, for the propaganda department. Um, and he had a car because he couldn't walk properly and he was always longing to go and to find Owen wherever Owen was. Of course, he moved with his company from place to place and finally he was killed and Scott Moncrief didn't hear of his death until um, a very long time afterwards. But not for the first time we see uh, your subjects um, very good literary judgment because before one, one might say that uh, he was interested in Wilfred Owen sexually and romantically, although Owen never responded to his advances, but uh, he also knew before anybody else how good a poet Owen was. Sorry? He knew before, uh, Scott Moncrief sees before anybody else that here's somebody who's going to be a great, great English writer, isn't it? That's right, yes. He realized in reading his poetry that he had met his better poet. Um, and that this was the, the point where Scott Moncrief gave up writing poetry himself, although up to that date he'd had quite a lot of poetry published in literary periodicals and in collections of war poetry. He actually wrote quite funny war poetry, um, and which gives a very different, a different, very different aspect um, to uh, British war poetry. One shorthand defini um, definition of a translator might be somebody who is many people in literature, somebody who can take on the voices of many other writers. But uh, there is a sort of uh, continuum between Scott Moncrief in, on the page and Scott Moncrief uh, in the world in that he also had many separate lives and some of the closest people in his life didn't know about one or the other. Yes, that's right. He had... He, he, he compartmentalized his life extremely well. So um, there was the family man who loved his family, corresponded continually with his mother, kept in contact with his brothers and his masses of nieces and nephews, and in fact supported his bro family, both his brother's families, and paid for the education of his nieces, nieces and nephews. And then there was the homosexual, which the family part didn't know about at all. So this was a part which he confided in to people like Edward Marsh, who was a civil servant. He was Winston Churchill's private secretary. And he wrote lots of letters, intense personal letters to him. And to one man in particular, who was Oscar Wilde's son, his name was Vivian Holland. Um, and uh, he, these were letters that I didn't find until the book had been finished. The book was finished, and I handed in a portrait of a man who I thought was high-minded, hard-working, quite spiritual and religious. And then I discovered 500 sides of letters um, of his sex life. Um, and these were written in French and Italian and Latin and Greek and German uh, because in order to evade the censor. Uh, 
but, and they were pretty X-rated. In fact, I have to say that had I found all these letters right at the beginning, I might not have written the book, because reading somebody else's sex life in that intense detail is really not very interesting, quite off-putting. However, it had to be put into the book, and these were all filleted right into the book at the very last minute. But anyway, that was that particular man. And then, of course, there was the spy, and this part of his life was hidden from nearly everybody apart from those he was working for in uh, the war office. And this was something that I only discovered late into my research um, because those parts of his war office file had been deliberately removed in 1932 and burnt. They had all been destroyed. Um, and, um, and then I, I worked out that nearly everybody he was associated with was actually a known spy. So I and worked out his role in looking, up, looking out um, what was happening in Mussolini's Italy before the Second World War. Because Mussolini was ostensibly on British, Britain's side at that point. This was early 1920s. But in fact, on, on the other hand, he was planning to take over certain parts of the Middle East, especially the Yemen and the corridor down um, toward, towards the Suez Canal. Um, and uh, so Scott McCreef discovered that, in fact, battleships were being loaded up with armaments on the Italian coast and that these were being continually shipped out to try and work up some revolutionary um, anti-British feeling amongst uh, the Yemenis. When we look at the translators at the time of European literature into English uh, of that generation, Constance Garnett, Scott Moncrief, you see that a lot of the books that come out in the time were books that they themselves chose and wanted to translate, i.e. the record is not just a record of their work in translation, it's also a record of their taste. So what is it, how did Scott Moncrief in this life suddenly come upon Proust and why does he decide this is a very important sound that's never been heard before? Well, he was uh, casting around for something to do after Owen's death and the death of many of his other close friends. And um, he came ac across Proust, who he realized um, uh, on reading it that he was a great writer. And he tried to persuade um, two publishers to publish him, and they'd never heard of Proust and they didn't want to publish him. But um, he was very convinced, and so he translated the first volume by himself while he was working on the Times as a sub-editor, and uh, then finally persuaded Chatto and Windus to publish it. For him, it was sort of therapy. Um, the war had been a shattering experience. He was nervously fractured. And Proust is a slow dissection of time and memory, and it calms you down to read it, and even more so to translate it. And for him, it was a healing process. It was a psychological and spiritual healing process. Well, um, there have been a lot of translations of Proust since, including the recent Penguin one. It took a whole set of translators to put together six volumes. So it seems incredible, 100 years on, to think that he translated several million words of Proust in eight years across the 1920s, and they all came out from the, in the work of... There is something very satisfying in the fact that all of Proust is available in one hand, isn't it? And that is the base on which other translators, of which other translators work. Well, he's the only person who tackled the whole thing. The uh, most recent translation of Proust has taken seven translators seven years, so that's 49 man years. And Scott Moncrief did it within eight years, at the same time translating Stendhal, Pirandello, Abelard and Eloise, the Chanson de Roland, and writing thousands of letters. I had really no idea of the extent of his correspondence until I started to look for them right at the beginning, and they are kept. Uh, they were bought mainly by American universities in the 1960s, which happened to so much English literature, uh, scattered in great bunches all over the United States. Although there is one huge bundle in uh, Reading in the Chatter Archive. Well, literary culture now almost forces on the translator kind of extraordinary uh, and false modesty. You have to keep on saying, oh, it is a writer, oh, everything that you like. Uh, everything that people like about the book is the writer's um, skill and everything that's wrong is, a, is something the translator got wrong. Scott Moncrief is on the opposite end of the continuum. He thinks of himself more as a, like a conductor of the great writers in a way. And when Proust comes out in English, he prefaces it with his own poems and dedications to, in all the volumes, isn't it? Uh, 
Yes, that's right. He didn't see himself in the shadowy role of a translator. He um, had as big an ego as a creative writer. And he saw himself in the sort of like Tortelier interpreting Bach or Olivier in sh interpreting Shakespeare. He, um, and in fact, Joseph Conrad, um, when he read Scott Moncrief's translation, wrote to say that he found the translation to be a greater work of literature than the original. Um, in fact, quite a number of, of, of uh, writers have, have said that. Mm. But um, uh, um, Scott Moncrief did write poems in the beginnings of each of the volumes to his own friends. Mm. Uh, a very important figure in his life is his mother, who you see not only as, as a writer, but someone who taught him to read. And I know that there's this... Uh, I wonder when, if, uh, when he writes about his mother, he's thinking of Proust in that very long sentence he writes at one point about how his mother taught him to read. Yes, this, uh, this sentence is very indicative of um, Proust's relationship to his mother, Charles's relationship to his mother. In fact, um, the relationship of a mother to um, every mother to her children when she reads to them. And, and this, this is only one sentence. It's a very long sentence, being Proustian. Um, it's talking about words. She came to them with the tone they required, with the cordial accent which existed before they were, which dictated them but which is not to be found in the words themselves. And by these means she smoothed away as she read on any harshness there might be or discordance in the tenses of verbs, endowing the imperfect and the preterite with all the sweetness which there is in generosity, all the melancholy which there is in love, guided the sentence towards that which was waiting to begin, now hastening, now slackening the pace of the syllables, so as to bring them, despite their difference of quantity, into a uniform rhythm, and breathed into this quite ordinary prose a kind of life, continuous and full of feeling. Does, uh, let's try and go back to the time. Does, when does Proust find out that he has an English translator, and then what does he make of this translation? Because at, Proust doesn't, has hardly any English, isn't it? No, he doesn't have very much English, although he's tried to translate Ruskin himself in the beginning, but, uh, I, uh, but uh, he was helped, helped with that. Well, he is told by some, one of his friends um, that it's been translated into English and the title is The Remembrance of Things Past, mm. which uh, is not a direct translation of A la Recherche du Temps Perdu. Mm. And um, Scott Moncrief chose Remembrance of Things Past, as it was a quotation from Sonnet 30, which is one of Shakespeare's sonnets, which says, when I, um, to the silence, sweet silence thought, sweet silent thought, bring up the remembrance of things past, because he thought that you couldn't possibly find something which encapsulated à la recherche du temps perdu, which means both time wasted and time lost. So he thought a poetic reference, which at that time, Everybody who was going to read Proust had read Sonnet 30, and so it was a very direct reference for him. So, uh, in a way, uh, um, a kind of example of the sort of fertilizing effect of translators everywhere, once Scott Montrez Proust comes out in English, instantly it has a huge effect in the London of 19, the late teens and early 20s, and a lot of the great modernists. Uh, have a new awareness of the possibilities of the novel through Bruce and the sense that he has something so internal and it's just a life of the mind routed through some memories and it, these, there's kind of obsessing play, obsessive playing on the same variations and yet it uh, becomes a work of great majesty. Yes, well he was uh, the most important modernist writer. He was mm. the beginning of modernism. He was the first stream of consciousness novel, and he directly influenced uh, Virginia Woolf, who wrote about the first time she read Scott Moncrief's translation. Well, she took her influence from the translation rather than from the original, and so did Joyce, they both did. And, um, and, and also the fact that it was so enormous that he kept up this extraordinary work for all of eight volumes. Sometimes it was translated into 12 volumes when they were split up. But 1.2 million words, the longest great novel that's ever been written. Uh, when you look at the figure of Marcel in the novels, there is a kind of uh, um, similarity between that and Charles, isn't it? There's somebody who... Um, whose private life is almost bigger than that of the life of the world around him, and who has all these secrets which he like slowly lets on to. Every time some, Marcel reveals something, you also feel there's so much he's hiding. Yes, there's, 
In fact, that was why Charles was so suited to translating Proust, because he was so like Proust, Marcel, himself, someone who internalized everything, who lived through literature, who had a very, very strong relationship with his mother, and who was a homosexual who had to hide this all his life. So his life was always um, covering his traces. And, uh, and, and in fact, Proust puts his, uh, his, his female characters are actually men in his own life, so he has to disguise them in that mm -hmm. way. And Scott Moncrief wrote his first early poetry to men, uh, but um, these are scored out with women's names put above them in his private diaries. So we know that early on, Scott Moncrief is a literary journalist, but once his life in translation picks up, he almost seems to like this more, that uh, he works, perhaps he's closer now to the center of literature. What are the economics of translation at the time? Was Bruce also um, a star in Scott Moncrief's uh, financial life. Could he, after that, say he could devote his own life to translation? Well, Proust's financial life and Scott Moncrief's financial life were very different. I mean, he was, uh, Proust um, was personally wealthy, so he could write his book. And he published the first volume himself, because nobody wanted to publish the first volume of Proust, so he had it privately printed. Um, Scott Moncrief um, had to earn his own living, um, and he, uh, and Translating was much better for him in that sense, rather than writing poetry. Um, and he was given commissions with money up front by Chateau for every book, and he also very cleverly um, secured separate American contracts each time. So that, he, and in fact, the Americans paid him much more than the British did. So he was, um, for a writer of his time, wealthier than others. Um, in fact, he developed such a good relationship with his American publishers that um, when the novel, which is entitled in French, Sodom and Gomorrah, could not be published in England because of the obscenity laws. Um, the Americans brought it out first. And then he disguised the title, calling it Cities of the Plain, because in those days, everybody would have read the Bible, and everybody who read that would know that the, cities of, on, the two cities on the plain were Sodom and Gomorrah, and so that was his elusive title. In fact, he uh, jokingly called it Sissies of the Plain, in the 20s, Scott Moncrief decides to move to Italy. What was um, his reasoning behind that? And am I correct in assuming he knew no Italian at that point? Sorry, he knew. Did, was he not, did he have any Italian on him? Well, no, he didn't have any Italian, but he had uh, studied Latin which is very, mm. and, and French. So I think he would have picked it up very quickly. Mm. The reason he moved to Italy was on the surface. Um, that he was tired of London. So he had the, a meeting with some of his best friends, one of whom was Noel Coward, um, around a table and announced to them all that he was going to Italy because it was cheaper to live there, it was warmer because he had a problem with his leg, and um, there were lots of writers in exile living in Italy in this cheap, warm climate. But in fact, he was actually being sent out there uh, by um, another distant cousin who was working in the intelligence service in Rome and who wanted him to help him with his reports. So now CK Scott Moncrief is both a translator and a spy professionally. Yes. And was he earning a salary of both or just one? Oh yes, he was under the salary of both. In fact, I, I, I think the, there's a wonderful moment in your book where he's sending the, his, the new volumes of Proust back in the diplomatic mailbag, isn't he? He sends all his, all his translations back in the diplomatic mailbag, and he occasionally drops things in his letters, which uh, points to the fact that he was spying. And also he moves up and down the country um, in, in pensiones and hotels the whole time. Two weeks here, two weeks there, two we and they are all on the coast, which makes you wonder why he did that. Mm -hmm. So how does one, in a life like that, reconstruct the paper trail? What did you have to do to find all? As you say, you had almost finished writing the book and then you came across these new letters which had, was about his private life. Mm -hmm. But other than that, the manuscripts, uh, the notes, the notebooks, where are all of these to be found? Well, I inherited a lot of them in a suitcase, okay. which mm -hmm. was what started me on this trail. Uh, because he is my mother's great uncle, and she gave me this suitcase. And all his letters are, have the date and the place. So you can cross-reference these with uh, what was going on in history at the time and, uh, and, and the politics of Italy at the time. And uh, it, I suppose it's very complicated to explain it all at once, but it is, and also, in, he, he did leave clues. He, um, there is one of his translations of Stendhal, and, which is pu uh, a published one, and in every 
page he has written where he was and and um, the date. Mm. In Italy, um, uh, this seems to be a very act of unusual confidence. He started picking up Italian and soon decided that he wanted to translate Ita new Italian writers at the time as well. And he found he would uh, send his enthusiasms back to his publisher ch uh, at Chateau and Windows, and often there would be just no answer. But finally, he comes across this figure, Pirandello, and he begins and he has some success with that. What is it that attracts him to uh, Pirandello's work? Well, he just found some Pirandello in a bookshop, and he instantly wrote to Chateau saying, this man is the goods, freeze on to him. He is, he is going to be the, the greatest writer in Italy of the next generation. And Chateau did not believe him. They said, I'm sorry, we've lost quite a lot of money on Proust. I don't think we're going to do Pirandello. And then uh, Scott Moncrief wrote back with the best argument he'd ever come with, and he said, do you remember that I told you to buy the rights to Noel Coward's plays, um, and you didn't do it? And at that, uh, Chateau bought uh,